Origins Desertion or Value Maximization, which is part of the Rock Center's um, evening speaker series. We usually have these on the second Monday of every month, and today, of course, we're having it on a Tuesday. Um, next month, we'll be having our event on Monday, November 10th, where we will welcome Governor, Delaware Governor Jack, Jack Markell to our speaker series. The Rock Center is a joint initiative of Stanford Law School and Stanford's Graduate School of Business. If you'd like to find out more about our programs, about tonight's wonderful panelists, or about our many future events, please visit us at rockcenter.stanford.edu or follow us on Twitter at, at Stanford Rock. My name is Kathy Wong. I'm an academic fellow at the Rock Center. Tonight's panel is extra exciting for me because my own research is also about corporate inversions, um, which have dominated the headlines for months. So with that, I'd like to introduce our distinguished panelists. Professor Ed Kleinbart joins us from the University of Southern California Gould School of Law, where he is the Ivadell and Theodore Johnson Professor of Law and Business. Prior to joining Gould, Professor Kleinbart was the Chief of Staff of Congress's Joint Committee on Taxation and a partner at Cleary Gottlieb. He also has an excellent new book, We Are Better Than This, How Government Should Spend Our Money, which was on sale before this panel and continues to be available at Stanford Bookstore. I'm also very excited to welcome Ron Creamer, a partner at Sullivan and Cromwell in New York. Mr. Creamer heads Sullivan's tax group and also leads the firm's M&A practice. His practice focuses on distressed acquisitions and dispositions in the financial sector and maintenance and value optimization of beneficial tax attributes. This panel is moderated by our own Professor Joe Bankman, who is a professor here at Stanford Law School. Professor Bankman is a leading tax scholar and the author of two wide, widely cited tax case books. So with that, I'll turn it over to Professor Bankman. Uh, well, thank you, everyone. And I should say uh, uh, thank you, Kathy. And uh, uh, Kathy has indeed written a really interesting piece about this uh, topic. So when you're reading up on it, you can read her piece when it comes out as well. And I also want to say that while Kathy mentioned some of uh, some things that are relevant about my old friend, Ed, what she didn't mention is that next fall, what you need to know about Ad is he's going to be a visiting professor at Stanford Law School. So there you have it. We look forward to that, Ad. Uh, moving up. <laughs> certainly moving north. Yes, moving north. Uh, so uh, before I begin, let me get a sense of who's out there. I'm just going to ask, hands up, uh, uh, how, many, uh, how many of you are students? Okay. Faculty? Okay. Uh, lawyers? Great. Uh, business affairs types? People from the community that just like to stay informed? Welcome, everyone. So uh, to kick it off, you know, I'll ask if you heard about this Miami Dowager B. King, right? She's announced an engagement to this Canadian guy, Tim Horton. And it's kind of a funny deal because they say it's a good fit, but B is never leaving Miami, even to visit uh, Horton from what we can see. And Horton is never leaving Toronto to visit B. Uh, some suspect it could be about money because as soon as the marriage is complete, B plans to renounce her U.S. citizenship and save money on all of her foreign income. So this marriage, the kind of Burger King, uh, Tim Horton marriage, which goes by the name of corporate inversion, has been repeated scores of times or anticipated, anticipates uh, some other transactions. Uh, Obama calls it unpatriotic and has had the Treasury uh, issue some new regulations designed to take at least some of the vigorous out of it. Uh, tonight, I'm going to uh, lead our two experts into a discussion about what inversions really are, a better explanation even than I managed with that faux, faux marriage, uh, what's at stake, uh, what the Treasury is trying to do, whether it'll work, and finally, what else we should do for uh, more fundamental reform in the area. Uh, that'll take about a half an hour, and then there's going to be time for questions from the audience. Uh, with that in mind, I'm going to ask each of uh, Ron and Ed to uh, spend a few minutes giving their perspectives of this. And I don't know if Let Ron go first. I'll start. OK, thank you, thank you very much, Joe. Uh, so I think uh, just a level set about what is an inversion, that, that's what I'm going to spend a couple of minutes on. So an inversion is an M&A transaction. 
It's a combination of two companies, a U.S. company and a non-U.S. company. And uh, in that sense, it's a real transaction. Uh, it, it's not something that's fake. It's not something that's manufactured. There is a real M&A transaction. And the question is, are tax concepts too disproportionate a driver of the transaction? But it's always a real transaction. Uh, the, the second thing to note uh, is that an inversion doesn't produce tax benefits. It sets the stage for future tax benefits. So the idea that sort of immediately one gets a lower tax rate, that doesn't happen in an inversion. In fact, if you just let the inversion structure sit there without doing anything, you might get a worse tax situation, not a better one. Um, the, the other thing that I wanted to stress is that sometimes people uh, characterize an inversion, and I'm going to refer to this picture pretty soon back there, characterize an inversion as some kind of transaction where you get a mailing address outside the US, and it saves you a bunch of taxes. Uh, that really is not a correct characterization from my perspective either. There's always a foreign holding company on top of the transaction. Maybe it's the, it, it could be a foreign operating company, but usually corporations don't structure themselves that way. There's a holding company on top. And so because the holding company never does very much, never ever, not in inversions, not anywhere, they have board meetings, but there's not much that goes on at that company. There is a perception that having that company on top of the US is somehow fraudulent or uh, uh, is an excuse to uh, lower the tax rate. And again, that's just a typical kind of transaction. Um, and to set the stage for uh, the potential tax benefits that derive from an inversion transaction, I wanted to just refer back here, which may not be easy for everyone to see. But in, what I tried to draw up there is there are four cases. One is that the, in the combination of the two companies, the foreign company and the US company, uh, the US shareholders wind up with almost all of the shares of the combined company. In other words, more than 80%. That's the left case. Another case is that the US shareholders wind up between 60 and 80. A third case is that the US shareholders wind up between 50 and 60. And a final case is when the US shareholders wind up with less than 50. And how does that happen? Well, in a combination, one could do a combination in a share for share exchange. And so then one's shareholder base would predominate if the size of the company was bigger. Uh, or one could do a transaction which is partly cash consideration in which case it wouldn't depend on which company was bigger, it would depend on the nature of the consideration and who's getting that consideration. But for the cases in the inversion world, the types of consideration in the transaction are not that important. It's really what happens at the end. What do the shareholder, does the shareholder base look like it predominates from the US company? And so to summarize, the very bad case, which people don't do because it just doesn't work, is the left-hand one. If the US shareholders are 80% or more, that just doesn't work. In the case which is 60 to 80, that's the case that everybody was doing and may still do. Uh, there are some detriments to that transaction. And as we're going to talk about, more detriments were added recently in a notice that came out. The third case, where the US shareholders are 50 to 60, there are some detriments, but much reduced compared to the 60 to 80 case. And that 50 to 60 case was not affected in any way, maybe in a tiny way, by the notice that came out recently. And then the transaction where the US shareholders are less than 50%, that's an OK transaction. And one could think, well, intuitively, what that, that gradation is trying to show is it's weird to put the foreign company on top when its shareholders are a small percentage of the whole. That, that's what I view the, that example as proving. But it also proves that there's a gradation. There's not some qualitative difference. There's not, there's not a line that you can draw there that says, here's patriotic and here's unpatriotic, at least from my perspective. There's, a, there's line drawing, which needs to be done in tax law, uh, but it's not qualitative differences. It's quantitative differences. And really, it's hard to say that one, one transaction is bad 
in a moral sense based on that because all of them have the same capacity to strip earnings from the US. All of them. Every single one. And so some of them are perceived as bad, some are not bad, but they're all in that sense the same. And that's a, an important concept to get across as a beginning uh, level setting for inversions. So Ed, I don't know how. Sure. No, I, 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 um, you're going to discover, for those of you expecting uh, fireworks, uh, they may come later, but Ron and I actually uh, agree on an awful lot. Uh, and uh, I thought he, uh, his introductory remarks are very helpful here. Let me try, for, for those who uh, uh, aren't uh, as familiar with inversions, to, to just make the, the point a tiny bit sharper, which is that, as Ron says, these are, just, these are real acquisitions, real M&A transactions that are identical in form to any other uh, uh, acquisition that you might imagine, with one exception, which is that they are uh, true economic uh, M&A transactions as reimagined by Humpty Dumpty. They are upside down in terms of their natural structure. The uh, larger dominant firm uh, suddenly becomes the target and the smaller uh, uh, firm that is described in the press correctly as the economic target in the transaction effectively is the acquirer. And uh, another way of, of, of just conceptualizing this is that we structure these transactions so that the minnow swallows the whale. Got a lot of mixed metaphors going, but you, you get the point. Uh, and so uh, uh, what Ron is saying up here is, is a very important point. There is no magic to the minnow swallowing the whale by itself. If we simply stop there, uh, nothing has escaped the United States tax net. Uh, nothing changes with respect to the whale's tax returns because it just has a new shareholder. A foreign company is now the shareholder. And so the question is, uh, why do you do this? What's driving these transactions? And is there something specially bad <laughs> about that? Uh, the structure we understand to be backwards. In a world without tax, uh, uh, the whale would swallow the minnow. Uh, the larger U.S. firm would be the acquirer, as it is in economic and commercial substance. Uh, uh, but so what? what? Other than aesthetics, what offends us uh, uh, about that? And I think the real problem is that it, uh, the, transaction, the transactions are ones in which um, the tax motive of the post-acquisition opportunities that are created solely by virtue of having established the ultimate foreign parent company on top of the structure, that by virtue of having that foreign parent company, we now open up a range of tax planning opportunities uh, that we did not have available before, and we do it in such a transparent and in-your-face way is why people react so viscerally that inversions are bad. But as Ron tried to demonstrate, uh, when real foreign acquirers acquire real U.S. companies, and foreign whales swallow U.S. minnows, all the same issues are presented, but not in quite so visceral and transparent uh, a, a fashion. Um, so it's the question is, what are those tax opportunities uh, and, uh, that are created by virtue of having a foreign parent, and what are the appropriate responses to that? Last point, uh, following on something that Ron said, I, I just want to agree, and I apologize for, you know, for not... Um, uh, 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 being more uh, 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 true to my uh, political party. But th patriotism has nothing to do with this. Uh, it's, a, it, it's a great way to lure you in on a cloudy day. But uh, this is not an issue of patriotism. I mean, you know, uh, it, I, my joke is that, you know, um, it, it, if you leave the, the meat out on the counter and the maggots spoil it, you don't blame the maggots for spoiling the meat. You blame your spouse for not putting the meat back in the refrigerator. <laughs> but it, it, it's not the, it's, it, it, corporations have a, a range of opportunities presented to you. The corporate structure, the corporation itself is an entirely artificial construct that we treat as real, uh, especially for tax purposes, where we're unbelievably punctilious in treating the corporation as a person separate from its owners. Uh, 
uh, the entire the apparatus of the corporate tax is based on that punctilious regard for the corporation as separate from its owners. So the corporation and its objectives are um, uh, 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 simply separate from any question, in my view, of patriotism. And the question is not uh, how do we make companies behave more patriotically, but rather how do we constrain their behavior if, if indeed we need to in ways that are more appropriate to the purposes of our tax system. Well, let me, let me ask uh, some combination of you to kind of elucidate our audience a little bit more. I'm afraid we've been a little coy because we haven't really explained what these do. We've said there's different structures and there's tax planning techniques, but we'll, do one of you just want to give like two examples in five minutes why these are done? I can try and yeah. then you could jump in. So yeah. uh, the, let, let me go from the uh, least inflammatory. So uh, one, one tax benefit is that new growth that would have had to come under the U.S. company, but which didn't really belong there because it was foreign growth, no longer has to be under the U.S. company. So to say it more plainly, if there's a further acquisition to be done outside the U.S., that company can hang from the top foreign parent. That's, that seems logical and more appropriate. It, it seems hard to describe that as a tax abuse. That seems like a natural thing that one should be able to do, although that is an opportunity that's opened up by having a foreign parent. Um, uh, secondly, and uh, maybe, uh, well, I don't know how to rank the uh, abusiveness of these. Uh, secondly, and probably most importantly, uh, there is an ability to introduce intercompany debt into the system. Uh, and so uh, the foreign parent can not only make an equity contribution into the U.S. subsidiary, but can also make a debt contribution into the U.S. subsidiary. And the payment of interest by the U.S. subsidiary is deductible by the U.S. and often is not subject to withholding tax and often is subject to a very low inclusion rate on the other side of the transaction. So there's an arbitrage where there's a 35% deduction, maybe a 0% withholding tax, and a 5% inclusion just to you know, take numbers out of the air. So a 30, 30 cents on every interest dollar are saved in taxes. Um, a, another benefit is the ability to deal with, and this is again sort of a, uh, a follow-on point or a related point to growing outside the U.S. There may already be companies that have grown under the U.S. In other words, the structure may be foreign, foreign parent owns U.S company, and U.S. company does a lot of U.S. stuff, but it also has non-U.S. subsidiaries, controlled foreign corporations underneath. That creates issues for the U.S. company. Trapped cash is one of them, which has been talked about a lot. In other words, the company has a low tax rate uh, on active income that it earns, and if it repatriates it to the U.S., then the U.S. taxes it. If it doesn't repatriate it, then it just remains subject to a low tax. And so it's trapped in some sense because it can't be dividended out. Uh, that cash is more accessible uh, in a situation where you can skip the U.S. and send the cash all the way up to the foreign parent. Uh, that's a, we'll, we'll talk about this more, but there are trans part of the, some transactions were shut down by the notice, others are still available, but there is that ability to deal better with controlled foreign corporations, even to the, in the extreme case, to try to get the whole foreign corporation, not just its trapped cash, outside of the U.S. company and over to the foreign parent in the same way that a new foreign company would have been acquired. So that's what I would sort of term the, the possibilities for tax planning. Sure. Let me um, just amplify that. Uh, the, the, the slang terms, so we're talking about future foreign growth, we're talking about earnings stripping from the United States, and hopscotching is the term for accessing, with, I'm sorry to use that as a verb, but I've given up, accessing the foreign pots of cash that U.S. firms uh, hold today. And each of them, in effect, raises a, a, a slightly different question. Earning stripping, creating new interest expense that did not exist before, that is intercompany, 
between the new foreign parent on the one hand and the U.S. Uh, uh, subsidiary uh, on the other, so that the U.S. subsidiary is paying interest to the new foreign parent, uh, is all about base erosion. Uh, it's not, it doesn't in, implicate profound questions of uh, what is the definition of what is the appropriate scope of the U.S. international tax regime, or what is the uh, re what does it mean to be the, uh, a resident of a, of a country uh, from a corporate point of view. It's just about paying less tax through the artifice of internal leverage that has no visibility to the outside world in a, con in a consolidated. Uh, uh, gap financials uh, and no operational significance. And can I can I pause you there? And because of that, that terrain is a terrain that is well defended currently by the IRS, wholly apart from these rules. Right. So we have debt equity rules. We have 163J, which governs earnings stripping. And so that perceived abuse, which Ed correctly points out, means that there has already been a response. Now maybe it's not perceived as enough of a response. Right. But it is a well-defended territory. Right. It is a defended territory. It's a um, defended territory. You know, like, like the Turkey-Syrian border. <laughs> so, it, 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 uh, uh, and, and, and that's really, that is the policy question that is raised here. Because uh, uh, firms, uh, uh, inverted firms, uh, uh, which have the appearance of being the continuing U.S. firm by another name, are reducing their U.S. tax bills by virtue of creating this invisible internal leverage. Uh, the second, the hopscotching, uh, raises a different question, which is that US firms today are world leaders in global tax avoidance technologies. They have uh, pioneered new and creative, sorry, fellas, but it's true, and this valley is, got, let's take a fair uh, uh, lump of blame for it. Uh, the, or credit, as it or may credit, be. Um, uh, uh, these um, uh, technologies enable firms to develop what I call stateless income, uh, income that has been uh, separated from the jurisdiction uh, where there's the economic nexus uh, between the activity on the, on the one hand, the economic income on the other, to separate that uh, and then to set the income afloat to the lowest tax uh, port of call uh, that is convenient. Uh, the result of that is that U.S. firms today, U.S. multinational firms today, have two trillion dollars in offshore earnings. The, you, the rule is you can game the hell out of every tax system in the world to your heart's content as long as you don't bring the earnings back to the United States. Uh, and U.S. firms uh, are taking advantage of, of this fundamental uh, statutory regime have accumulated $2 trillion of foreign earnings, some of which is invested in real foreign businesses. But about a trillion dollars of that is in cash and cash equivalents, liquid investments, uh, US dollar investments, as it happens, but that's uh, another story. So firms are sitting on unbelievably large pots of cash, and that makes them sad. Uh, and it makes uh, their shareholders in particular sad because the shareholders say, if only we had that cash, we would be happier. And the firms, in turn, would have higher earnings per share and, um, other, and, and look better from a corporate finance point of view. And so inversions, again, are an artificial means of accessing that offshore cash. And, and let, let me make the same point that I made before, which is because of this possibility, this is also a defended territory, maybe not well defended, but defended. Right. I think we can agree less, even less well defended than the first. Even less well defended than the yes. first, but there are a lot of rules. And right. my, my point in making this again is that if there is to be a response to inversions, it doesn't seem to me to be the correct policy response to say inversions are bad. Instead, these types of earnings stripping rules are not tight enough, right. and they should be tightened. Right. Right. I think Ron and I agree ultimately on, the, on this point, that, that inversions are a distraction from the fact that inversions have revealed flaws in the statutory scheme. And those flaws are what need to be addressed. It's not that the inversions themselves are the problem. It's, it's that they simply uh, uh, rub in our faces the flaws in the statutory scheme. The third point, the one about future growth, is the most difficult from a 
conceptual point of view, because that does go to the question of what does it mean for a firm to be a resident of the United States or resident somewhere else, who, uh, which jurisdiction uh, has first dibs on taxing uh, that income, uh, how does the taxation of the corporation relate to the taxation of U.S. resident shareholders. That issue is a much larger um, one and uh, one as to which reasonable people have a wide range of opinions. But the first two are simply uh, unmitigated flaws in what otherwise is a very elaborate statutory scheme that inversions have forced people to confront, even though these flaws have been there for 50 years, since 1962, essentially. So there are three problems. Thank you. I think, was that useful for people? There are kind of three things that you're getting at with inversions. I wonder, Ron, if we need, I notice in your remarks, that there's a huge question about whether something is um, kind of a, a scheme, whether it's genuine or not. One way to look at this is just if you're the US Congress, what we want. So this is all really about policy choices. I mean, do we want a US firm to be able to earn money uh, in the UK without paying US tax on it? And that's the third question. We could re-describe all of these without using anything that has that kind of prejudicial uh, a comment about you know, loophole scheme and the like. Uh, let me, so now that we know what inversions are a little bit, companies are making these marriages, and these are marriages that, what's different about these marriages, I think you'll all agree, is that they're, they're tax-driven marriages, a lot of them. Maybe not all of them, but the wave of inversions are commonly considered to be tax driven. Some might occur anyway, but a lot seem to be tax driven driven marriages. I wonder if we might, if I might throw out a, another question for you all, is that uh, suppose we look at corporate governance issues. Is this, the suppose Burger King saves money on its future earnings or does earnings strippings or gets at some cash uh, that, uh, that it's holding offshore, it's going to now be subject to a different set of corporate governance rules. And that's true of anyone that does that. How do companies look at this? And how do you two look at this? Well, let me make two points there. I mean, I think that uh, even more uh, fundamental than the point that you raised is a related one, which is in, the, in all of these cases, one, two, and three, so as I said, people do not do number one, but people do number two and people do number three. Those, the number two and number three transactions produce shareholder tax. Uh, in other words, we have a two level tax system where uh, the, there could be a shareholder gain and or there could be a corporate level gain. And what we're saying in the cases two and three is the shareholder gain is sacrificed in order to improve the inside the corporation situation. And so some people are using that as evidence to say that there's no real tax saved by defending inversions, because actually there's a lot of tax that's gained by, uh, by taxing the shareholders. Uh, another way of looking at it is to say that the corporations are so selfish that they are not even listening to their shareholders that it's an evidence of corporate greed or managerial greed or something like that. But I think that the answer to my mind is less inflammatory, uh, although not less interesting, which is that the first thing you learn in M&A tax is that shareholder tax doesn't really matter. And why is that? It's because as soon as you announce an M&A deal, all your historic shareholder base trades into the hands of arbitrageurs. Your historic shareholders, with the exception of founders, employees, you know, family, friends and family, that, that kind of shareholder base, so maybe Silicon Valley is not, not typical in that sense. Every, every other shareholder trades to the ARBs. You, as, a, as a corporation, you don't care about the ARBs, and they don't care about taxes either, because they're in for a short-term profit that they are expecting to pay tax on. So for that reason, 
even if you sort of leave aside whether your shareholder base was tax indifferent to begin with, it becomes tax indifferent. And so nobody plans for shareholder taxation. So I think that this is kind of a false fight that's set up between shareholder tax and corporate level tax. I think to answer your question more directly, the choice of top jurisdiction is quite an important one. And so uh, there was, you know, the first wave of inversions went to tax havens. The, the next wave kind of went to Ireland, UK, Netherlands, Switzerland. Uh, and now I think people have sort of coalesced around Ireland, UK. And the reason for that is that those top jurisdictions are the most similar, most felicitous jurisdictions from an overall governance perspective. Uh, but people pay a lot of attention to that. I, I was with you until the last sentence, Ron. I think uh, uh, the, the, uh, uh, the recent uh, initiatives of the EU, uh, the work of the OECD remind us that uh, there is in the tax arena uh, uh, competition among countries in the same way that in the old days we had trade wars among countries and it is just as ruinous to the economic uh, health of countries. Uh, we don't have a gap for tax, uh, taxes and the fact is that the UK has gone into the business of being a classy tax haven uh, and Ireland is uh, in the business of just being a tax haven. And uh, uh, so uh, uh, they're the working man's tax. They're the working man's tax haven, uh, um, and so uh, uh, and you don't have to pay the high rents of London. Uh, so the uh, the fact is that it's not, I don't think, simply a case of um, uh, an exquisitely developed sense of the comparability of UK law and US law and the common heritage and everything that we've learned from Magna Carta. Uh, I think it's because they are cheap and cheerful when it comes well, to the tax burden. People are not, people are not choosing France, that's for sure. I mean, Th that's true. That's, that, that is correct. So I, I acknowledge that. Uh, I'm going to just jump in because I'm watching the clock for us. And one of the things that we've got to do is cover the, the proposed can, rules. Yeah, can, I, can I cover the proposed new rules in one sentence or two? Because well, we'll see. I guess you could. <laughs> because I don't, I mean, I think we should oh, okay. leave for quite, if people have technical yeah. questions about, about the notice. We can do so, but I think the, the takeaway is that um, following the president's uh, uh, speech uh, in Los Angeles on uh, the uh, patri patriotic problems raised by inversions, the Treasury Department, which had previously in July looked at its regulatory authority to address the specific questions um, of earning stripping and hopscotching that we identified earlier in particular and had concluded that they lacked regulatory authority publicly concluded uh, to right to to address those issues and here i disagree with um, uh, what joe had suggested earlier that my phrasing might have uh, uh, been inflammatory in fact these were flaws in a statutory system uh, um, and can can be de demonstrated to be such uh, it may be that the statutory system in turn wants to point in a different direction. But uh, Treasury having, having uh, concluded uh, that these were flaws that properly belonged to the province of Congress as owner of the tax model. And remember that the Internal Revenue Code is not just another statute. It does have 100 years of continuous intellectual capital invested in it. It is of uh, a statute of unbelievable length and complexity, um, and Congress owns that model. Uh, Treasury reversed course and in September came out with regulations, the purpose of which was basically to say that if you've got cash bottled up in a foreign subsidiary and you do an inversion transaction, you won't be able to get your hands on that cash. You won't be able to use the cash to lend it to new foreign affiliates, including the new foreign parent. You won't be able to use that cash to buy stock of the new foreign parent. So you will get no uh, uh, advantage to having inverted when it comes to accessing that pot of foreign cash. And that's really the, the entirety of the takeaway of the notice. 
And I, I agree with that. I mean, I, I think that everything else is blah, blah, blah from this perspective. So, so a company like Apple then might have $100 billion yes, offshore. Yes. <laughs> and what the notice says is inversions aren't going to help you get, make use of right. that. I mean, Medtronic is a, is, is, a, is a real life example of a firm that has a very large offshore pot of cash relative to the size of the firm where uh, accessing that cash was part of the original plan. And again, from, from Ed's uh, uh, narrative, this is the cash that is offshore because repatriating it would have raised US taxes. So companies have successfully kind of shielded from tax so far. That's a stateless income uh, metaphor. But here it sits, and now Medtronics can't get at it. Right. Okay. So let me ask you uh, the, the following question. I, I think that the notice is interesting for two reasons. One is a meta reason, and one is for what it did not do. So uh, the, the meta reason can be illustrated more uh, probingly when, it, when we did say what the notice did not do. The notice did not deal with earnings stripping. It did not deal with that intercompany debt between the foreign parent and the US subsidiary. And that, uh, from a quantitative perspective, was much more important to the typical inverting company than this trapped cash point. I don't know if I, if I, I it's certainly not true in every case. It's, it's not true in every case. My, my experience has been um, uh, in talking to folk that firms just fall into one pot or the it's, other. I, it, it, is, it is at least dealing with only half the problem. Uh, fair enough, fair enough. So, so then the question is, well, is there an, another shoe to drop? There is uh, sort of teasing language in the notice that there is another shoe to drop. Yes. And uh, the meta question is, well, what about regulatory authority? And to state it kind of baldly, suppose there's regulatory authority that says that uh, Treasury is allowed to distinguish between debt and equity. Does that give Treasury authority to distinguish between debt and equity differently for inverted companies than for everyone? Can, can you tolerate spot zoning as part of this regulatory authority, de de deferral to regulatory authority? Or is that a defect? If it is a defect, what happens? Yeah, people are very quick um, to gloss over the question of regulatory authority, and in particular to gloss over the specific context of tax, uh, of, of the tax law. Uh, tax uh, lawyers have been criticized for years uh, for engaging in tax exceptionalism in believing somehow that the that uh, uh, treasury regulations are uh, exempt from uh, any of the nuisances imposed by the Administrative Procedures Act. We know that to be false. Uh, uh, these are uh, uh, administrative regulations like any other, but that's not really the point, it seems to me. Uh, the point is that this statute is different. We have, I don't know of any other statute that can be said to be uh, so comprehensive, so detailed, and so by design, uh, self-actuating. The idea of the Internal Revenue Code is uh, that everything that happens in the real world has a corresponding lever or button that is pull, pulled or pushed inside this model called the Internal Revenue Code and out spits an answer. And the same answer spits out uh, in New York, New York, and St. Louis, Missouri, and Los Angeles, California. Uh, and it's a transparent process, uh, and it is, a, it, it is one where uh, the answers can be derived from reading the statute itself. The 33 Act uh, is very different, for example. You can't figure out what the hell you're supposed to do to get a, a public offering done looking at the 33 Act. So in context, and this is not a point about Chevron deference, uh, defer, uh, deference or anything of the kind, or uh, claiming an exemption from the scope of the Administrative Procedures Act, Given a statute uh, that is this comprehensive, this transparent, uh, and this elaborate, what scope in general is there for regulatory authority? And Treasury has traditionally operated on the basis that it has very little, relatively speaking, uh, authority uh, compared to how other administrative agencies uh, uh, properly uh, deal with their statutes. One consequence of this is that the 
Treasury has always been viewed as being surprisingly above the fray. Uh, Treasury has always been thought to be a remarkably non-politicized function uh, and uh, driven primarily by tax policy concerns. Uh, and so for tr here, Treasury acted very aggressively and apparently, or, or arguably, in a, very, in a much more politicized way than is, or, is ordinarily the case, for, for Treasury. And the question that is raised by that is, is first, what are the remedies available uh, if you disagree with what Treasury did? And second, uh, what are the institutional uh, concerns that are raised by that? And very remarkably for those on the law side of the ledger, uh, there, this is a case where if there are wrongs, there are no remedies. You cannot sue the government to enjoin the application of a Treasury regulation, nor can you uh, sue to have a uh, declaratory judgment that the regulation is invalid. All you can do is suck it up, take the opposite point of view, file your tax returns, wait to be audited, and then have an audit controversy years down the road. There is no effective remedy. Um, and that's another reason why Treasury traditionally has acted, I think, um, more circumspectly than might arguably be the case here. Yeah, the interim effect, you know, as a practical matter, you know, you're going in front of a board, and the board says, well, what do you think, Sullivan and Cromwell, about the authority that it has been utilized here? Is it a proper use of authority or not? And we say, well, you know, it, there's a pretty good case that you're going to win that. But that's not enough, you know, because of exactly what Ed says, that there is, it's years down the road before this gets resolved, and if it gets resolved negatively, it's a disaster. Yeah. And so there's a huge interim effect to these rules. And so it's a shame in some sense that it gets more politicized because there really is no remedy. So the rules, as I'm hearing from you, work in the narrow sense that they achieve some, their stated aim, which will yes. prevent some erosion of the tax base. And I'm taking that as kind of a, a, a treasury goal. I mean, you could have lots of goals to it, but that seems to be the treasury goal here. And in that sense, the rules are working, whether or not <coughs> in nine years when someone ch challenges them, uh, they hold up. Right. Um, I know we want to leave room for questions, but um, uh, I want to just follow up on one thing that Ron said is quite important, which is the other shoe to drop. That is, uh, why did Treasury not come up with sister regulations on uh, earning stripping, on, on just eroding the U.S. tax base, uh, which does not implicate any fancy pants international tax theory, uh, uh, but simply is paying less tax than a purely domestic competitor doing the same business in the same uh, place the United States of America is, is paying. Uh, and there, I, uh, I'd just like to throw out two suggestions. First, uh, it is entirely possible, since that issue has been joined more directly in the tax press, that there could be differences of opinion within the, the, the building, within, within Treasury, uh, as to the correct analysis. Uh, but more interestingly, I'll just throw out a, a sort of a, a political, uh, a, a pure political theory, uh, just to embarrass myself when it turns out to be false. And um, uh, you never make money, by the way, predicting that Congress will ever do anything. You can always, you always take the other side of the bet. But here, here's the theory. The theory is that the Treasury knew that it was uh, being a little bit um, creative in its uh, 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 regulatory authority claims in respect of the current notice. It was quite interested to see how heavily it would get slammed by Congress. It turns out, I don't know if you know this, but the House of Representatives is an unfriendly environment to the current administration. Uh, and, and so it is entirely possible to imagine the following sort of scenario. Uh, Treasury does this first notice. It threatens the follow-on notice. Uh, Congress comes back for lame duck. Uh, uh, Republicans are hopping mad. Uh, uh, not only did Treasury do all these aggressive things, but without any kind of transition relief for deals that have been signed and announced but not yet closed, uh, the Republican uh, feel very strongly that to the extent these deals uh, demonstrate a weakness in the ta U.S. tax system, the, the, the resolution should be a better tax system with lower corporate rates 
That's their absolute stated position. Uh, and they therefore um, uh, raise hell about the notice. The Democrats say, yeah, 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 whatever. All we care about is earnings stripping, which is also true. It's very clear that all that the Democrats care about is earnings stripping. And then maybe one in three chance in the lame duck, uh, Republicans and Democrats get together and take ownership back of an issue which always should properly have been in their wheelhouse. Uh, and Congress passes a little standalone inversion bill that is arguably milder in respect of uh, accessing offshore cash, because Republicans want that cash to be available, and, is, um, and directly addresses earnings stripping, which is all that Democrats care about. And Treasury says, we've got all the time in the world. We've been here since Alexander Hamilton. What's another couple of weeks? So they've already said in the notice that if they address earnings stripping, it will be effective to, on September 22nd. Give Congress a chance to take ownership of the issue. And if Congress doesn't, well, then in December, we'll come out with a follow-on notice. Um, elegant. <laughs> Entirely, you know. Uh, uh, and preposterous. Preposterous. Yeah, just, just now, you know, not, not fact-based. Now, but, I want to, Ron, to give you time, but I also want to give each of you time to address a kind of broader question before I open it up to questions, which is, what ought we to do here? And it's an open-ended invitation. You can address inversions. You can address corporate tax. You can address anything you want. Uh, well, I think it's. Uh, I think you're probably better at this, but I'll I'll make an effort. Um, I, Just I would pound the table. Speak loudly. I, That's I, all. That's I, all would, I would reduce the vitriol. I I, I really bemoan the. Uh, impoverished political discourse on this topic. That, that's what I would really root for. Uh, but if I'm trying to, if I'm from the Fisk's perspective, I think that I would uh, tighten the earnings stripping rules for everybody. I mean, that's what I would do. Right. Well, I have written a book that touches on these <laughs> topics and um, uh, the larger question. And uh, the, entire, the book is also very much focused on, on the poor quality of political discourse in this country uh, and uh, makes specific proposals. Uh, I also wrote a little article uh, at the beginning of the inversion uh, uh, excitement that, during the summer. Uh, and the way I see the world is that you need to move in two steps, not one. Uh, the first step is uh, to uh, preserve the status quo, not because it's good, but so that you have a tax base to reform when you get the corporate reform. So you need to preserve the status quo over the short term so that there is something worth reforming when you finally get around the corporate tax reform. And I therefore suggested uh, in a little paper uh, in the summer uh, uh, that Congress do basically what Treasury did in the notice except Congress has, you know, has the authority because Congress is the owner of the model, and that Congress should tighten earnings stripping rules, not because the, the result is, is optimal, uh, but because it preserves the status quo ante and is fair to uh, other US domestic firms that don't invert so that they, they, cannot, they do not feel that they are uh, no longer uh, competing um, on a level playing field, to use that hackneyed metaphor, in respect of U.S. domestic operations. And that's the key thought with earnings stripping. We're talking about U.S. domestic operations being taxed at different rates. It's just effectively a split rate. That's what earnings stripping does, is creates a split rate between inverted and non-inverted companies. You can pay half the rate. You pay half the rate. Um, by, so it's just a split rate uh, by virtue of, of, the, of, the, of the... So you preserve the status quo, and then you need to move promptly to corporate tax reform. Um, I am the only person who's ever, I think, spent time in Washington who uh, remains an optimist. And, uh, and so I think there's actually a glimmer of a possibility of business tax reform in 2015. And the reason is that the, um, the system is literally coming apart at the seams. Uh, the, we have the $2 trillion of, of offshore retained earnings. We have issues that we can talk about in Q&A where the, the, that entire system is premised on financial accounting, uh, financial accountants uh, endorsing the results that financial accountants are getting less and less comfortable endorsing. Ron and I were talking about this before. We need, therefore, to move to a more 
robust uh, business tax system, corp corporate tax system in particular. Uh, there are a couple of different places you can get there. My shorthand for them are territorial with teeth uh, and worldwide consolidation. Uh, you know, Q&A or otherwise, we can, we can tease out what those mean. Uh, but I think you need, the key thought is you need two steps. You need to preserve the status quo and then you need to promptly follow that with corporate reform. You can't get there all in one step. You know, I'm always reminded when we talk about this, because the present system is really such a horse's ass of that old Woody Allen line or the vaudeville joke, you know, he ends Annie Hall with this about the guy with the chicken on his head. And he goes to doctor, he says, doctor, I got a chicken on my head and it's driving me nuts. And the doctor says, well, get rid of the chicken. And he says, I can't, I need the eggs. So, so we get a couple hundred billion dollars a year from the corporate income tax. Uh, and needless to say, we need all the eggs we can get. And the real question is, what do we do, particularly in a world that we don't really understand that well economically and in a time of no partisan agreement, when we see these eggs starting to disappear? Yes. Um, well, maybe with that, uh, on that doleful note, why don't I open it up for questions uh, for our panelists? Could you please, because I, I am a little hard of hearing, and I don't listen, so <laughs> I, I encourage you to use the mic. What makes you think I was? Yeah. Um, I have a few little questions along the way. Kathy, are they on? Is the mic on? And could you say, um, for everybody, like, <coughs> who you are and, like, one word about yourself? Like, I'm a... Uh, a Pisces. A, yeah. <laughs> My name is yeah. Melissa. Okay, that's more than one word. <laughs> uh, Taurus. Cusp. Um, so if a SEC audit was to occur on these companies, how are they viewed? The Securities Exchange Commission No, I know who the, the SEC is. Uh, I'm just thinking, I'm thinking that Ron should answer that. Um, <laughs> uh, if, uh, uh, well, there, in every, in most inversion transactions, there is a disclosure document that describes tax synergies uh, among uh, other benefits of the transaction. And so th that's part of the public record. Uh, I don't, you know, I, I don't think the SEC views it as its role to police that one way or another. I think they view them, their role as forcing disclosure rather than deciding whether something is good or bad. So once it's disclosed, then they feel like they've done their job. Okay, that sort of flows into the second of my four questions. This one's the deepest one. So um, I have some forensic accounting experience in China. And so there's a scenario of using intercompany, no intercorporate loans in order to almost like a Ponzi scheme. So where is the wall here? And is that a risk? Uh, I can try and then you can jump in too. I mean, the, the intercompany debt is, uh, everyone knows in the inversion context that the intercompany loan is going to be very closely scrutinized by the IRS, very closely scrutinized. And so uh, there is a very, you know, it's a voluminous body of case law about what is debt and what is equity in the intercompany uh, loan case. And so people are being very careful in those. Okay, you know, so I'm gonna, yeah. I'm gonna limit you just to the two on the vain hope that we're gonna get so many questions. Okay. And if we don't, I'll just regret it madly. But the others are minor. Like, why wasn't the Netherlands up there? So to me, that's still a risk because I still don't know where the wall is. If I'm to, if I'm the person who's exploring the books for an M and A. How can I go through all the international companies? Is my my open question. No, I don't think it's, uh, the, 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 the U.S. Internal Revenue Service has the ability to see all the books and records that it needs to see to determine the tax liability of uh, any, any firm that either is a U.S. corporation or has operations connected to the United States. And the OECD has developed a new tax template whose purpose it is um, following uh, uh, the urgent recommendations in an article about Starbucks tax planning, uh, pithily titled, Through a Latte, Darkly. Um, uh, Who wrote that article, Ed? Um, that um, uh, to, to create a tax template 
uh, to improve the transparency of multinational groups from the perspective of source of countries around the world. But sometimes things are not found, but the intercompany loan is going to be found. Right. Nobody's going to be Right. Them. These are not Ponzi schemes. They're, they're, they, 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 they have other policy issues, but not that. Uh, hi, I'm Jonathan Schatz. I'm a JD MBA uh, here in my third year. Um, uh, Ireland uh, announced today that it would end the double Irish tax treatment, at least for tech companies, but maybe for, no, no, for, everyone. for, all, for everyone. Yeah. Uh, and um, I guess what that what that raises in my mind is, is to what extent um, does the United States have leverage in negotiating more uniform um, tax uh, regulations, um, and how important is that in tax reform? Well, it's a great question, and uh, just to, to clarify for everybody, uh, Ireland today uh, announced uh, that one of the favorite uh, and most transparent of the tax structures involving Irish companies called the double Irish or the double Irish Dutch sandwich structure uh, that has been written about in the press uh, will no longer work going forward. That a, technically, that a, a Irish company um, uh, uh, is going to have to be treated as either resident in Ireland, as having a real residence in Ireland or a real residence in another treaty jurisdiction. Uh, so uh, the, basically what's going on there is not the United States putting pressure on Ireland. That's what, this is about the EU putting pressure on Ireland. Uh, there are three different movements happening more or less in parallel. One is the EU, one is the OECD, one is the United States. Uh, the EU uh, is very troubled by the race to the bottom in tax competition within the EU. The, uh, if you think about the Tesla battery, case, uh, battery uh, factory, where uh, California and Texas and Nevada fell over themselves to throw money at Tesla to, to, to induce it to locate the battery factory in their respective jurisdictions, that is illegal inside the EU. Uh, member states of the EU cannot do that. That's called state aid, and you're not allowed to subsidize to buy jobs in that way. Uh, and it turns out that uh, uh, Ireland uh, has uh, done has two things done two things that, that frustrate the rest of Europe. The first is it operates with an extraordinarily low corporate rate of twelve and a half percent, and the second is it was engaged in illegal state aid. It was buying jobs, but doing it through the tax system. And so, what uh, in my view, what Ireland has done today is to offer up as a sacrifice the most artificial and most transparent of its uh, uh, co-conspirator, co-conspiratorial devices, the double Irish structure, uh, in order to try to hold the line on its much lower corporate tax rate, which was put directly at issue in the bailout, when Germany and France wanted to force Ireland to raise its corporate rate as part of the bailout terms. So they want, that's what's ultimately driving that. The OECD, which is this trade association of all the developed countries, uh, has, um, for the first several decades of its existence, operated on the basis that its purpose in life was to ensure that uh, multinational firms were not subjected to double taxation anywhere in the world. And finally, they've woken up to the fact that double taxation is not the problem. The problem is double non-taxation. And so starting about two years ago, OECD reversed course. But neither the EU nor the OECD is in any way similar to GATT. That is, we don't have a global agreement to um, uh, initiative to uh, address uh, subsidies delivered through tax systems. And it's, so we have OECD, which is reverse course. We have EU, which has tumbled onto the fact that, firm, that, that member states are engaged in illegal state aid through disguised tax systems. And then we have the poor United States. And the United States is a very conflicted place. The Treasury Department uh, finds itself caught between a rock and a hard place. On the one hand, it freely acknowledges that US firms are the world leaders in global tax avoidance technologies. On the other hand, there are guys. There are guys, and everyone's picking on them. And so depending on which day you ask, the Treasury is either figuring out we've got to do something about those rascals, or why is everybody picking on our guys? And so um, we don't have 
for some reason that's very hard for me to explain, a GATT type solution to these kinds of issues of tax, of, 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 uh, of bo a bogus tax competition, not tax competition in terms of rates for real business, but tax competition in terms of aiding and abetting uh, the stateless income planning. Now we've got some more questions, Sorry. so I'm going to ask. No, it's okay. That's great. I'm just going to try to get as many people in as possible. I woke up this morning, uh, turned on my uh, CNBC, and saw that my Gilead stock dropped drastically because of Ireland, <laughs> what they did. Um, I have a it's, a it's a bitch when you have to pay tax, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. It was for me. Yeah, yeah. They didn't Look tell on the bright side, you woke up this morning. That's right. right. Yeah. At our age, you know, that's, that's something. And I, anyway, I, I, my name is Shelton Ehrlich. I'm uh, classified on the invitation as general public. Salute. <laughs> Um, I reinvest dividends in a number of the things I own and then not in others. And it occurred to me that the solution to the corporate tax reform issue is why don't we just do away with the corporate income tax and charge all profits to the stockholders? I could reinvest some. I could, in my mutual funds, use some fancy electronic service that would help me choose the ones I wanted to reinvest in. You know, you're going to get an answer. So just in terms of time, because it's such a big, good question, I'm going to let our Well, let me just say what, uh, one sentence. Answer. I think this is mostly you, too. But uh, to my mind, that certainly improves your, the, the tax system has a has difficulty uh, predicting the incidence of taxation. So when you tax corporations, you don't know whether you're taxing the shareholders or the employees or the jurisdictions in which they do business. It's hard to know who bears that cost. When you tax a human being, you know. And so the idea that in a perfect world you had no corporate income tax and then you got whatever progressivity you wanted by taxing humans that's a, you know, that may not be easily achievable as a political matter, but that seems like a pretty good idea to me. Right. So uh, it is an idea that has been um, uh, frequently mooted. Uh, there have been a, a, a number of serious efforts to develop uh, the idea. Uh, the corporate tax raises about $300 billion a year in the United States right now. So we're talking about a significant amount of revenue. No, he said 200, <laughs> but I know the data. So uh, it's, about, it's about 300. Uh, so, as a percentage, though, it's, it's about ten like percent. It's about ten percent. So that's still uh, the the idea of taxing owners directly is a very appealing one. It suffers, in a practical level, from a couple of problems. One is um, uh, that it is very difficult, and we have experience in this in something called master limited partnerships. It's very difficult to, to allocate income on a daily or hourly basis, and yet some people own stock for a day or an hour, and we have to have a rule. Second fundamental problem is that those kinds of imputation schemes of, uh, tend to work better with publicly traded firms, but for the, you know, the very short-term traders, than for private firms. Um, and uh, 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 so that we get a, um, a, a, a split in, in, in your tax system, a uh, dividing line between public and private. You also get dividing lines between debt and equity. And these are significant practical problems. I will observe the following, that in the case of the United States, we are very lucky because U.S. firms today, notwithstanding globalization, U.S. firms today are overwhelmingly owned by U.S. people still. The official government statistics would say it's about 85 percent overlap, which means that you can view the corporate income tax, of, despite all of its issues, as, in fact, just a withholding tax that is being imposed on owners. It's just a withholding tax collected from the most convenient source, um, you know, the, 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 the operators of this, of this business but where 85% of it, in fact, is, is being borne by the right people, which is U.S. shareholders. 
It's not a perfect story, but it's one that I, I think, you know, gives a different uh, perspective on the problem. It, it, yeah. Okay. So my name is Chuck Jones. I was a technology stock analyst and currently write for Forbes.com. My question has to do with corporations be able to bring overseas cash back to either, you know, pay dividends, increase share buyback, or in theory, invest in the business. Is there a, where were they able to do that before the new regulations came out? And has, how has that changed, if it has, since the new regulations came out? Um, the new regulations inhibited that, uh, the ability to uh, bring cash back for category two up there, not for any of the other categories. And when I say inhibited, I mean inhibited, which is not prevented, uh, but merely took away the top of the grab bag uh, for ways to repatriate the cash. There, you know, I think the difficulty from a policymaker perspective, which is not easily appreciated unless you go into practice, is there are a lot of solutions to problems. And so if the government takes away one solution, then you just move down to the next best one. And the next best one in this context is not that much worse than the first best. So was that a clear benefit for corporations to do this, to be able to bring the cash back and avoid a 35% tax rate? Uh, if you mean, was that a motiv one of the motivating factors to do inversions? I think it was one of the motivating sure. factors. Uh, I, you know, to my mind, it was not uh, an overwhelmingly motivating factor, depending on the particular situation. But as a general matter, it was motivating, but not overwhelmingly so. I'd like to just unpack the, the bring cash back point, because it's a very important one. Uh, it is not, it's so unusual to have a, a really good natural experiment uh, in, this, in this world. And we had one here. In 2004, the Congress decided to uh, encourage cash to come back from overseas and gave a one-time, never-to-be-repeated tax holiday. It was sort of, you know, our little sort of, you know, Italian experiment. And so, uh, so we had a tax amnesty. And the, the promise from corporate America is that this cash would be invested in American business and create American jobs. And the, the issue has been analyzed quite carefully. And the, the, the bottom line of, of uh, sort of consensus analysis is that what happened is the money went exactly where you'd expect it to go, which is in dividends and stock buybacks. We don't have a problem financing business in America today. A big business can borrow at historically low rates. If there's an investment opportunity, it will be um, filled by someone. Uh, what we have is companies with bloated balance sheets, with, with just a wash in cash that drags down earnings per share, that just drives shareholders crazy, that management wants to get to shareholders because management also is shareholders. Uh, and it's, so it's not, it's bringing cash back, yes, but it's not bringing cash back uh, to invest in a cash-starved America. It's to bring cash back uh, because shareholders feel rightly that they'd like their chance to invest it uh, for themselves. Yeah. Right, thank you. Hi, my name's Tom Dennedy. I'm an alum, and um, I work in venture capital now. I, er, I haven't seen much serious policy analysis about um, looking at how this affects new company formation. Um, you know, it seems like we're all focused on how to milk this cow that we've got and these billions offshore. Um, but you know, there's uh, you know plenty of options today, and uh, and companies aren't natural. You know, many are formed in Silicon Valley, but the teams are global. It's not a natural that they be incorporated in Delaware. Yeah, I mean, that, that's a uh, kind of softball question in some sense because, uh, you know, if, if you are advising a startup and you, you say, well, where do you form? You know, the idea that you start outside the U.S. is pretty compelling if you have the capacity to do so. Uh, and not only that, but um, private equity, for example, when they're buying companies will often <clears throat> uh, say, well, look, just to preserve optionality, I'm going to buy through a non-U.S. parent company. And then I could, I don't have to worry about inverting. I'm already inverted. Um, so I do think that that is uh, something that the tax system needs to be worried about. Because if there's such an incentive for new businesses not to form in the U.S., or at least to not form the parent in the U.S., 
that seems like a problem to me. I might add uh, one emendation of that. Is that really the problem I think that you outlined goes further than the question of where someone is formed because once you've got truly global operations and uh, engineers all over the world, attributing income anywhere becomes more of an art than anything else. And the government's always going to be uh, playing catch up on it. So even if it's a US corporation in some sense, getting, finding out where the income is earned in any case is becoming harder and harder. And that's kind of another challenge we have for uh, uh, right. it, it, It's a really important yes. point that, that uh, I think we're all sort of driving at is that the notion of corporate residence is a fundamentally artificial one. And our definitions today are particularly artificial in this country. We just look to where the uh, entity is incorporated and nothing else. So corporate residence is artificial. But as Joe just said, uh, 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 the source of corporate income is fundamentally imponderable. And so we have this, this Hobson's choice between the artificial and the imponderable. Uh, and that's what makes international corporate tax uh, so frustrating. And so great for all of our students that are taking it. Uh, I want to thank everyone on that doleful note uh, and thank our panelists. <laughs>